Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be solving a radical equation in two ways. So I'll be presenting two methods and let's start with the first method. You know the first method is not always the first method. Anyways, we're not going to talk about it right now. So, my first method basically involves the following. I'm going to be using substitution. But before I do that, I want to check the domain. If I don't, I know some people will be very mad, right? Just kidding. So, notice that we have a square root of x, so x must be positive. And we have a radical equals x minus 1. So, x minus 1, square root of something in the real world, has to be greater than or equal to 0. Did I say greater than 0? It should be greater than or equal to 0. We also have that x minus 1 should be greater than or equal to 0. That implies x is greater than or equal to 1. But if x is greater than or equal to 1, it automatically implies that x becomes greater than or equal to 0. So I just need that x to be greater than or equal to 1. Let's just remember that as we solve this problem. So the first method involves the following. I want to substitute this. So let me rewrite my original problem. I want to use substitution, so why don't we call 1 plus square root of x y? And you know why? This is going to give us something nice. That's why. So if I do that, I get square root of y equals x minus 1. And then add 1 to both sides and we get 1 plus square root of y equals x. But notice that this was our assumption and we got this equation. Together, they make a nice system. That's why we did this. Okay? That's why. So now, how do you solve this system? By subtracting these two equations. Why? What's the motivation behind subtraction? The motivation is uh, it'll make it factorable, one reason. The, the second reason, I think, is we can get rid of one. So you can also do the following. You can uh, isolate one from each equation, like one can be written from the first equation, one can be written as y minus square root of x. From the second equation, one can be written as x minus square root of y. So now, you do get a single equation. Now, we had a single variable, we turned it into two variables, now we got a system, and then now we turn it into an equation. That's, isn't that weird, like algebraic manipulations? But they're fun. Okay, great. And this has an interesting flavor to it, a golden flavor. This problem has a golden flavor. Okay. Now, to solve this problem, I want to put everything on the same side. Which side should I choose? Mm, I'm not sure. How about the left-hand side? Let's go ahead and bring everything to the left-hand side. So y minus x minus um, plus square root of y minus square root of x equals 0. Awesome. Now, I wrote it that way because I want to be able to factor it. And y minus x, is it factorable? Well, if you think about the radicals, it is. I can write this as square root of y plus square root of x multiply by square root of y minus square root of x from difference of two squares. And that's kind of nice because it allows you to factor this by grouping. And, and, the screen just goes boom. Now we have a common factor, square root of y minus square root of x. Yay! We can take it out. And when we do square root of y minus square root of x, remember here every quantity is well defined. Uh, it should be, right? Uh, we get square root of y plus square root of x plus 1 and the whole thing is equal to zero, of course. Now, take a look at this. We have a product. Each factor can uh, equal zero, but this, for the real world, cannot equal zero. Why? Square root of y and square root of x are both greater or equal to zero, and if you add one to it, you'll never get zero from there. No way. Unless you get into the complex world, but we're going to stay real here. Okay. Now, this implies that square root of y minus square root of x is equal to zero, which implies square root of y equals square root of x. And since x and y are well defined, so on and so forth, this implies that y is equal to x. And what does that mean? Well, what is y in the first place, right? Well, y is equal to 1 plus square root of x. So now I get this single variable equation again. Yeah, so going kind of back and forth with these algebraic manipulations and all these substitutions. So I got to solve this equation. And that is a radical equation. And obviously, there's different ways to solve it. But guess what? One method is 
isolate the squared effects and square both sides, or you can just use substitution. Since I love substitution, I'm going to use that. So suppose squared of x equals u. Okay, happy birthday. If it's your birthday, happy birthday to you. And from here we get the following. u squared minus u minus 1 equals 0. And as you know, the solutions to this equation are given by 1 plus minus square root of 5 divided by 2. This is where we get the golden flavor. But u is square root of x, therefore I can set it equal to square root of x. And since I'm trying to solve for x, I should square both sides, shouldn't I? Okay, so if square root of x is equal to 1 plus root 5 over 2, then from here x becomes 1 plus root 5 over 2 squared. And if you square it, you get a plus b quantity squared, which is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. To keep a long story short, that gives us 6 plus 2 root 5 divided by 4. And if you simplify this, you get 3 plus root 5 over 2 for the first x value. And if you set the square root of x to 1 minus root 5 over 2, from here you get something super duper similar. So can I just write the answer? It is going to be 3 minus root 5 over 2. Now, square root of x values are conjugates, therefore their squares will also be conjugates. That's something really nice about radical equations, and I think in a lot of these videos, we use that idea to solve equations too. If you have like x and y that are conjugates, you can raise them to the millionth power, and their millionth powers are also going to be conjugates. And we, use, we also use this idea to solve Pell's equations. Remember, I did, I think, two videos on Pell's equations. So those are the two x values. But one thing we got to remember, going back to the domain thing, right? We said that x needs to be greater than or equal to 1. So are both of these values OK? Let's go ahead and check. For example, 3 plus root 5 over 2, is that greater than or equal to 1? And the answer is yes, because think about it, even 3 halves is greater than 1. So that's definitely going to work. So the first solution is OK. But if you look at the second one, do you think this value is going to be greater or equal to 1? That implies 3 minus root 5 is greater or equal to 2. Again, that's a question mark because we don't know if it's true or not. And can we safely say that square root of 5 is less than or equal to 1? That's definitely not true. Therefore, the second solution just fails to satisfy our equation. So we end up with one solution, which is kind of interesting, the real solution, the real deal. OK, great. Let's go ahead and take a look at the second method. And by the way, I just want to say thank you so much for the beautiful comments and for all the support when I said I worry about the length of the videos. You guys are amazing. I just want to say that. Thank you so much for everything you do. Second method involves just brute force. OK, we take this, you know, we take this expression and square both sides. And we're just going to keep doing it. Let's do it. So square both sides. Obviously, this is going to introduce extraneous solutions. We've got we to gotta be careful. OK, when you square first, you get the following. One cancels out. That's the nice thing about it, which means that we're going to get a simple equation. And we square both sides one more time. Let's do it. And when we do, how do you square something like this? I, I, I tend to think about it as this so that I can square each one. I don't know about you, but that's what I like. So I'm going to square x. That's going to give me x squared. And then x minus 2 quantity squared is going to give me x squared minus 4x plus 4. And then I'm going to distribute. And you can direct the square too. That's not too hard. x equals x to the fourth power minus 4x cubed plus 4x squared. And this is a quartic equation, so don't be scared because x is a common factor, so we can simplify it and make it a cubic. I mean, cubic doesn't really make it super nice, but this is a good one. So when I divide both sides by x, now think about this. The, is x equals 0 a valid solution? And the answer is no, because in the original problem, like uh, this one, right? If you replace x with 0, you get 1 from here, but you get negative 1. In the real world, the square root of 1 does not equal negative 1. In the complex world, it does. OK, great. So I'm going to ignore x equals 0 and divide both sides by x. And if I do, I'm going to get a nicer equation, which is a cubic. But not only that, it's also going to be factorable. Yay, by grouping. So x cubed minus 1 is a difference of 2 cubes. So I can write it as x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1. And the rest 
can be factored as negative 4x times the quantity x minus 1. Now x minus 1 is a common factor, let's take it out. And we get x squared plus x plus 1 minus 4x, but x minus 4x is negative 3x, right? So I can just write it like this. And then from here we get three solutions because, come on, this is a cubic. One of the solutions is x equals 1. So I gotta check that. Remember, I said when I square both sides, I may be introducing extraneous solutions and I have to check the original equation. And when you plug in 1, you get uh, square root of 2 on the left hand side, but on the right hand side you get 0, obviously they're not equal. So 1 does not work, so I have to check with the other ones. And guess what? The other equation is quadratic and it gives me two solutions and get, guess which solutions we get from here? Yes, the, the numbers with golden flavor squared. Let's go ahead and solve it with the quadratic formula. Negative b plus minus the square root of b squared, 9 minus 4, which is 5. And yes, exactly the same results we got from the second method. So let me go ahead and separate these. But remember, we said that x needs to be greater or equal to 1. But this is not greater than or equal to 1. So we're going to reject the solution. And we end up with one solution again. And this brings us to the end of this video. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you tomorrow with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.